Uh, Dr. Henry is on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees, and the Esquimalt First Nations. In today's briefing, Dr. Henry will be speaking first about uh, the BC's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and a number of issues arising from that today. And then Minister Whiteside will give an update on uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the education system and the restart of schools. And then I'll finish with an update on a, a number of issues and then we'll be taking your questions. So with that, it's my honor as always to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. And good morning. Thank you very much. As I don't need to say uh, today, SARS-CoV-2 or what causes COVID-19 continues to persist, to evolve and of course to surprise us in many ways. We cannot predict with certainty exactly what is going to happen and we've seen that as things have evolved over this last two years. But we can and we must make educated or informed um, guesses or decisions based on the imperfect information we do have. It's not mathematical certainty, but it is based on the best information that we have best information from what we know from history around different coronaviruses and other infections around immunology and around what we're seeing around the world. It is the best information we have but it is by uh, necessity imperfect and in that context that is where we are moving ahead now with how we're going to manage to get through this next wave, the Omicron wave here of the pandemic. We have all seen that the virus continues to spread, that Omicron is spreading very rapidly. And I said last time that uh, where we had one or two generations of separation, now everybody, I believe, knows somebody or has somebody in their close social circle who's been affected by COVID-19. That means this is going to be a challenging month. But it doesn't mean that we need to stop everything. We know that the basics, the foundations of what we have in place, the things that we have learned to do, and the measures that we have in place currently are going to help us get through this month. As we've done since the beginning of the pandemic, almost two years ago, our goal is to mitigate the impact of this virus, to make sure we're doing our best to stop sickness and death to make sure we're supporting our health care system so everybody can get the care they need and to minimize the negative impacts of everything that we're doing on society. So we all need to continue to work together in this storm, in this version of the storm that we're facing right now. And as we've done in the past, we know that we have the means and the foundation for how to get through this, this Omicron rave. While some things are different, a shorter incubation period, which means some of those tools that we've relied on, we can no longer use effectively. But much remains the same. Staying home, staying away from others if we're sick, wearing a mask, wearing a good fitting mask, especially when we're around others. Vaccination. Vaccination has made it a different storm in many, many ways, and it means that the impact can be mitigated in all of us. It protects us, it protects our families, it protects our communities. So making sure that everybody has their first and second dose, and as, we, uh, as you're eligible, get, getting your booster dose. Keeping your distance from others in those places where we don't know people, um, especially indoor places. Washing our hands regularly, keeping our gatherings small, making sure we are using the orders that are in place to, to mitigate and to prevent transmission in some of the highest risk settings. Earlier this week, I spoke as well about the importance of businesses reactivating the COVID safety plans. That was a strategy that we used very on, early on in this pandemic to really develop specific strategies for each specific business or industry. And these worked. These helped us get through the last number of waves and they will help us get through this one too. It becomes more and more important as we're seeing that increased transmission in our communities. And these safety plans are a measure to allow you to keep operating in the face of a significant portion of, of workers who may be unable to come in because they're, they're ill themselves now with COVID. It is important that every business take this step now, which is why today I am putting an order in place requiring COVID safety plans for all businesses in British Columbia. 
WorkSafe BC, and we've been working with uh, uh, many different industry tables and had many discussions uh, over the past week or so. And WorkSafe BC is working with us in partnership uh, again on these and has reactivated their supports for businesses and is available to address your questions. As an employer, we know that you have an obligation to do all you can to keep your employment uh, environment safe and your employees safe. And I know the vast majority of businesses have stepped up without hesitation and many have continued all of the measures from their COVID-19 safety plans from the previous iterations. This is about activating all of those layers of protection again to reduce the impact of the Omicron circulation in our communities and making sure we can continue to operate our businesses. It's about business continuity and we know that this has proven to work to keep businesses open and to safely manage. This order is specific to industry and businesses and of course does not apply um, as it didn't in the previous iterations to childcare or post-secondary or the K-12 where we have additional other uh, plans in place that are unique to those settings. These are the plans that saw us through up to now, it includes things like barriers and reduced crowding and making sure we can uh, uh, reduce the mixing of staff if need be, um, working from home if that's possible, and facilitating workers staying home if they are ill. These are the things that will work again this time. This week, our K-12 school communities have been working hard to put enhanced protocols in place and to plan for how we're going to weather this storm and ensure that we're able to provide those essential educational services to our children across BC. And I want to give my gratitude and thanks to all of the educators and school staff and parent groups and families across the province for what you have done in this past week, putting things together and will continue to do as all students are returning to classrooms next week. It is essential and it's a priority for all of us that we keep schools open and functioning for our children. It's, it's also important to remember that the structured settings that we have in school have been proven to be places where they can learn and interact with others and have that important emotional, physical and intellectual growth and development in a way that is um, safe for everybody in that setting and safer than many of the unstructured settings that children are in outside of the school environment. We know that uh, there's a lot of anxiety and it is a, always a challenge when we have uh, more illness in our communities, how that's going to affect schools and we've been working very hard this week to make sure that we have contingency plans in place for if staff are ill, if educators are ill and for students and public health will be working as we have with all of our schools and our school districts to make sure that we can support you in the safe return to full classes starting next week. Having said that, it's always going to be a challenge and we're going to have to adapt to things as they arise. Um, I know that many parents are anxious about children uh, coming back to school, particularly if you have vulnerable family members at home. And I just want to reassure you, reassure you that the things that we have in place will do our best to mitigate any of the challenges that we have. And it's important to remember as well, we have very high rates of immunization in school staff and I encourage all the children who are eligible in schools now to get vaccinated as well. Um, school is essential and we know it is the best place for children to be. And I know that the educators and school staff around the province are very excited to welcome children back into our schools next week. We've also seen the remarkable resilience and adaptability of our school communities and I know that's what is going to help us get through which will undoubtedly be some rocky times in the next few weeks. On December 21st, we laid out in, in some more detail our plan for our expanded use of rapid antigen tests here in BC. Um, and we've said that we focus on, uh, particularly through to the middle or end of January, that we're going to be focusing on five key areas, making sure that we're supporting long-term care, 
um, our test sample co uh, collection sites, our testing sites, and that has been incredibly important, as many people have noted in the past few weeks, as we reached our, our capacity, uh, both uh, from testing, uh, from the lab equipment, from uh, the personnel and uh, the reagents. We know that uh, PCR testing is the most accurate, but it has, has a limit, and the, we've reached that limit in British Columbia. It's still an important measure, and PCR testing needs to be uh, used for those uh, where it makes a difference in terms of their clinical management. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But because we've had the rapid antigen tests of the various different types of tests that we've had here in BC, we've been able to supplement our testing sites with the rapid antigen testing, and that has enabled us to make sure that people who do need a test can get access. We're using them as well for healthcare workers in acute care settings, in remote, rural, indigenous, and, and other more uh, uh, vulnerable communities to make sure that we can tell when Omicron in particular is entering those communities and support those communities in taking actions. And of course, we've been using them in an ongoing way, which we are expanding in businesses and other organizations. There has been significant progress deploying these tests since we talked about that. And uh, I will uh, defer to Minister Dix to give you some more of these details, but just to say that we have deployed close to 100,000 to long-term care, to support uh, long-term care facilities, uh, to testing sites. We're now over 400, close to a half a million tests, supporting our testing sites across the province. Um, and we've got many out to rural and remote communities working with the First Nations Health Authority. So the tests that we have have been moving out. They are all accounted for. And we are continuing uh, to access uh, t tests for businesses and organizations as we get more of them in. As well, we are using uh, rapid tests to help us understand where outbreaks, outbreaks and clusters are happening, including being able to support our K-12 system in the, in the coming weeks on outbreak management under the direction of the medical health officers, as we have been doing. We do expect that additional rapid tests will be available. Um, you've heard the announcement from the federal government. A portion of those tests will be coming to British Columbia. But let me make it clear, they are not here yet. And when they begin to arrive, there are many different types of tests that will be arrived. Some of them will be suitable for self-administration, the lateral flow tests and uh, the at-home tests. Those are the ones that we have been waiting for for some time. And as they arrive, we will be deploying them again, starting with our, our priority areas. And one of those priority areas, of course, will be to support um, continuing in-school education in the K-12 system will be starting when they start to arrive uh, late next week, we're hearing, uh, for uh, being able to test symptomatics, teachers and school staff and uh, in schools across the province. And the Ministry of Health and Education and BCCDC and school districts are working together um, starting this week and until these arrive to make sure that we have the systems in place to be able to do that and the protocols for self-testing. It's our expectation, subject to more of these, uh, these um, at-home tests being available, that we'll be able to uh, expand that in our school communities. And I've talked about this for some months, being able to provide it to, uh, for kids, uh, for children who are um, symptomatic in the school system, and eventually, as we get more available tests, um, to be able to support families to do the tests at home on symptomatic members of the family of the children uh, to determine whether they should be going to school or not. We have made significant progress deploying these tests despite um, challenging winter weather and all the other things that have been thrown at us over this holiday season. And we're continuing to break down the many tests that we have that come in kits that are too large to be used um, uh, in an individual basis. And replacing the nasal pharyngeal swabs with the, the nasal swabs that are needed for uh, a number of the different types of settings that we have. We expect our supply of tests to increase in the weeks ahead. And uh, just yesterday, we were advised by Canada that we're getting a number in, hopefully by mid next week, which would be good news. As 
our supply increases and as we go into the next few months we'll be able to expand it uh, for symptomatic people and for people to be able to do that type of testing um, at home. But the key focus in the coming week will be, as I said, on supporting K-12 and return to school. Here in BC, rapid tests are being used to slow or stop outbreaks and uh, to allow people to go to work. They're used as a red light to help us understand if they're positive, um, that somebody has COVID or that COVID is in an area or a community. They are not being used as a, a green light to allow people to socialize as we've seen being used in other places. Every rapid test has been allocated to settings where the risk is highest and where the test will have the greatest impact. And that has been our focus here in British Columbia with this uh, precious commodity that remains in short supply both here in Canada and globally. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about um, getting tested. We know, and I've said this, not everybody needs a test. And this week we've seen some frustration of people wanting access to both PCR tests and rapid tests and uh, um, taking that out on healthcare workers in our testing centres. Please know that we have a limited supply and we do need to use tests where they are most appropriate to protect people, to make sure that people can go back to essential workplaces like healthcare workers, and to uh, be able to identify people who may be at risk for more severe illness so that they can get uh, additional treatments that they may need. So really we're focusing on people over the age of 55, people who are pregnant, people working or living in high-risk settings like hospitals, long-term care, assisted living in many remote and rural communities, and people with higher risk medical conditions. Those are people who may need these tests to help us keep them out of hospital, make sure they get the treatments that are available as, as uh, quickly as possible. If you are fully vaccinated, at lower risk, and have mild symptoms, you don't need a test. Omicron is spreading widely in our communities. If you have those mild symptoms, whether it's a runny nose, a cough, and you've been uh, out in connection with other people, it's very likely that you have COVID. What you need to do is stay home and stay away from others um, and manage your symptoms. And there's information on the BCCDC website about what you can do to help get through those symptoms over the, the period of your inf infectiousness and the period of your illness. For most people, we are seeing now with this new strain that the onset of illness is within a very short period of time after exposure, so about three days, and that the illness is mostly mild if you're vaccinated and you have that level of protection, and that it tends to go away within three to five days. So we are saying to people, if you have mild illness and you're vaccinated, stay home and away from others for five days. And then you can go about your business as long as you're feeling better and you uh, no longer have uh, a fever or symptoms. And the things that you need to be aware of is that you need to continue to wear a mask when you're around other people, a well-fitting mask at all times, and to avoid those high-risk settings where it's the off chance that you might pass it on to somebody else. Not everybody needs a test, as I've said. They are a limited resource and we need to use them to ensure people who need them have access, whether it's healthcare workers and long-term care and access to medications. So that uh, there'll be more information coming out and I encourage people to look at the BCCDC website to look at how you can uh, assess yourself for whether you have COVID or not and for those who have rapid tests, um, how you can report that test. I know that for many people, this is a very challenging time of the year and Omicron has just made that even more so for all of us. The days are cold and still short and this has put an added burden on us all. While these challenges do persist, I encourage you to find that optimism and hope that we have, that we're going through this together. We have the tools that we know work and we need to go back and reinforce them and reinforce them with each other. Find an opportunity to go outside. I know it's very cold in many places, but go outside, go for a walk or call a friend, 
call so, um, a person you haven't talked to in the last few uh, days or weeks. Connect with people. We know that connection is really important, especially this time of the year. Appreciate and offer the small kindnesses to each other that brighten our day and make us um, get through this as well. We will make it through this Omicron surge, it, and we will get through this storm of this pandemic, and we'll do it together. And we'll do it as we always have, by being kind and being calm and being safe. I'd now like to turn over to Minister Whiteside. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henry. Uh, Dr. Henry, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Whiteside. I'm BC's Minister of Education, and it's an honour to join you uh, this morning from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. I want to just to start by acknowledging that, you know, we've all been living through this pandemic for now what feels like a lifetime, and yet here we find ourselves again in a new and very different phase with this latest variant. You know, for younger children, going to school during a pandemic is all they've ever experienced. And for youth, older children and youth, they know full well how different these past two years have been to other than, than any before. And to all of our, uh, for all of our, our, our school staff, our educators, support staff, principals, vice principals, our superintendents, trustees, all of our education partners, your work over the past two years has just been extraordinary uh, as you have put children at the center of everything uh, that we do uh, in, uh, in our K-12 system. And it's been a challenging time for all of our school staff, our district staff, our trustees, for families, uh, and of course, uh, for, for students. And I know that this is an anxious time for parents and families. And I know that everyone on the front lines is doing their very best as we continue to work together to meet the challenges posed by, uh, by Omicron. As we've shown over the last two years, our education system is ready and able to adapt to keep our kids safe and in school. As directed by Dr. Henry, the return to in-class learning was postponed until January 10th. And this has provided time for schools and school districts to adapt to the changing pandemic. And we have been working this week with our K-12 Education Steering Committee, which is made up of educators and parents, support workers, school leaders, trustees, Indigenous rights holders, ministry staff, and of course, uh, public health experts. Uh, and we have been working with, uh, with many uh, uh, superintendents and, and local school staff as well. As we experience the Omicron variant move through our communities, we're focused on protecting students and education workers. What we know is that since the pandemic began, we have seen that schools are a reflection of what happens in the community. And so we know that, that students and staff and our schools will be affected uh, by, uh, by this latest variant. And that's why we want to ensure health and safety measures are in place so children and youth can learn in school to the best extent possible. And that has been the basis of the work this week by school districts, uh, uh, schools, uh, the steering committee and the ministry, and, and of course public health. This preparation uh, that, uh, that has been done will mean that students can be welcomed back to school next week to in-person learning on Monday with additional safety measures in place. And while our goal is to have students learning in classrooms, we recognize that there will be likely temporary shifts <clears throat> in how and where some students learn. This means that learning at home may need to be in place for some students over the coming weeks or months. So on Monday, schools will be open with reinforced safety measures in place, including uh, the provision of three layer disposable masks, which are the masks that, that look like these ones. And those are the masks that we have been providing in schools throughout the pandemic. And we've worked to ensure that we, that districts have a, have a good supply of those masks. They are, there will be measures uh, to, intro, to reduce crowding, to stagger break times. Uh, we will uh, be shifting to virtual assemblies, virtual staff meetings. Uh, uh, we will be restricting visitors to schools for the, for the time being. 
And I just want, I would like to say about masks that we know uh, that, uh, that we've been advised by public health, of course, that masks are an important layer of protection and that students and staff will continue to use this important layer of protection while they're in schools. And so what Monday will look like when, they, when students come back to class uh, is uh, a refresher on the proper way to use a mask, the importance of using a mask, how it can help keep um, everybody safe, as well as a refresher on the, the overall safety plan. I mean, we do ask parents to send their child to school with a three-layer mask. However, we will ensure that these masks are available at school for anyone who needs one. And it is critical that every single day before coming to school, students complete a daily health check, staff as well, to stay home and stay home if they have any symptoms. When it comes to communicating with uh, the school community what's happening with, uh, with, uh, in our schools with COVID, I, I understand that, uh, that parents and caregivers want to know what's happening with COVID in schools. And so we have worked with public health on a system to ensure that we can continue to provide communication to parents. This is going to look, though, very different um, from what has been in place before, because as public health has advised us, individual case management and, and contact tracing is no longer a, a, a helpful tool for us in, in tracking cases uh, in schools. We need a proxy to understand what may be happening with COVID in schools. And so that proxy will be school attendance. Schools will be monitoring attendance rates closely and will notify public health and the school community if attendance dips notably below typical rates for this time of year. And that will trigger a response from public health, which may include investigation, it might include the use of rapid tests to get a better understanding of, of what's happening on the ground. Now, I do want to assure uh, everyone that, of course, our school medical health officers work very closely with school district leadership on a regular basis, a day-to-day -day basis, and that, of course, will continue. To help with effective uh, information sharing, parents are encouraged to report rapid test results to public health and to ensure they contact the school if their child is staying home because of illness. By working together, we will be able to best understand what's happening in our school communities and to determine how and what to communicate with parents. I want to say that I know that there is a lot of anxiety right now, and I know that there will be bumps in the road ahead as we navigate the next few weeks. It's a difficult time for students, staff, and families, and this pandemic continues to present challenges for all of us in our communities. The work that our schools and our district staff have done uh, over this week with our partners has helped to develop plans and prepare for continuity of learning in the event that a school needs to shift to home-based learning um, for a period of time. So uh, our goal there is to minimize the disruption to learning to the greatest extent possible. I want to say as well that vaccination, of course, remains uh, such a critical tool to keep our schools and communities safe. And it is uh, uh, terrific and news that so many teachers, of course, have been vaccinated in BC. We know, uh, you know, the vaccination rate amongst teachers is upwards of 95% according to the, uh, uh, to the Teachers Federation. And we know that last year, public health prioritized many school staff um, for vaccines in the, in the, when vaccine, vaccination became available. And I understand that many teachers and school staff will have already received their boosters or, or, or are in the process of receiving their invitations to book their booster. And, you know, the news of uh, vaccinations available for the 5 to 11 um, age group uh, has been a very hopeful development and I know continues to be a, a priority um, with respect to our vaccination campaign. And I strongly encourage everybody who is eligible and parents to, um, to book, their, uh, book their, their, their appointment to, uh, to have their young one vaccinated. Finally, I, just to say that I, you know, we, we have really focused on ensuring we can continue to keep kids connected to in-person learning throughout this pandemic. Extraordinary work has happened to achieve that goal, and it's been challenging, and we're not out of the woods yet. But we have risen to meet uh, the many challenges in this pandemic, and our ongoing work together will help ensure that students have safe spaces and places to learn as we work to manage the disruption of Omicron in our K-12 system. 
that's our goal and commitment for today and to work to this end until we put this pandemic behind us. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Minister Whiteside. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Uh, today I'll be providing an update on uh, hospital capacity, on uh, immunization, surgical postponements, and our inventory of rapid tests. Uh, with respect to um, the number of people in our hospitals today, uh, we have, as you know, uh, as we've discussed before, 9,229 uh, base beds in our healthcare, in our hospital system, and 2,353 surge beds. We have 510 critical care base beds. We have two 818 uh, surge critical care be beds. And I just want to take you through where we are as of this morning. Um, 8,778. Uh, uh, we have 8,778 patients for our 9,229 uh, base acute care beds. That's 95.1 percent full. That number in itself is not surprising. It's our expectation to run at that level. In fact, a year ago, prior to the, uh, two years ago, I should say, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were running at about 103.5% on these beds. So that's where we are now. With respect to the 2,353 surge beds, 593 of those are full at the moment for a total of 25.2%. With respect to acute care beds, I mean, critical care beds, I should say, of the 510 base beds, 454 uh, are occupied at the moment. Of the 218 surge beds, 223 are occupied. That's 89 percent and 10.6 percent, respectively. As I've noted and as we've noted, the reason why government has taken the ministry, the provincial health officer, and the health authorities have taken action to delay uh, non-urgent scheduled surgeries in these times is in part uh, to ensure that we control or limit hospital capacity so we have space for patients with COVID-19 who may need hospital care. And in addition, and just as importantly, to deal with issues of, um, of medical absenteeism, in other words, people who are unable uh, to come to work because they are sick. So it's not just an issue of we have these many beds available. It's also a significant staffing issue, which is why we are taking the steps we are taking and will be taking to ensure that we have uh, that we limit other uses of hospital uh, beds in our province. Um, with respect to immunization, uh, the last two days done more than a, administered more than 100,000 uh, vaccines, overwhelmingly third dose vaccines in British Columbia. So that's over 100,000 in the last two days, 50,000, more than 50,000 each day. As of now, um, we have uh, 4,391,912 first dose immunizations and uh, 4,132,009 second dose immunizations. And with respect to booster doses, 1,089,410 booster doses have been administered in British Columbia. The priorities have been uh, laid out since we announced our plan on October 26th and by the weekend. It's our expectation that everyone who had their second dose um, uh, more than six months ago or 182 at their 182nd day will receive an invitation to book. As you'll remember, in uh, the, the uh, in previous waves, in the third wave, when we start when we had a, the main part of our immunization program in BC, we gave priority to essential workers in many sectors, including uh, critical food uh, service workers, obviously teachers and others received significant priority. So those groups of people will reach their six months sooner than the average population, and we would be expecting everyone to be invited to book, and we encourage people when they're invited to book to book. There remain a significant number of unfilled appointments in BC, although we are adding a significant number of people to the system and adding appointments every day. So if you say have an appointment for January the 25th, uh, new appointments are going up every day, and I talk to people every day who, when they check again, are able to move up their uh, vaccine appointments, and I encourage all of you to take advantage of that. 
with respect to uh, rapid tests, I just want to go through the numbers for you so that we understand it, and particularly in light of the federal announcement made um, uh, yesterday by uh, the Federal Minister of Health, Mr. Duclos. Uh, to date, just to go back, and all of this was presented uh, in detail on December the 21st when we laid out our rapid test plan. BC has received 3,891,447 rapid tests and deployed 2,752,335 of these tests to key strategic areas. Up until December 15th, uh, BC had distributed 1,266,513 rapid tests across five key areas, long-term care, provincial corrections, rural, remote, and indigenous communities, case contact and cluster management, and businesses and organizations through the point of care screening program. On December 21st, we outlined a plan to continue and expand the use of rapid tests to COVID-19 testing sites, long-term care, healthcare workers, rural, remote, indigenous, and vulnerable communities, businesses, and organizations, and medical health officers to support case management and outbreaks. Between December 15th and January 5th, we deployed 1,485,000 822 tests to these areas. Just over the last three weeks, BC has delivered 207,030 tests to long-term care facilities in BC. 20,000 of these tests, in fact, were delivered uh, yesterday, 87,000 prior to yesterday, and 100,000 are in the process of being delivered. That leaves in BC a current inventory of 1,139,112 tests. Approximately half of the current inventory of tests 561,672 are not suitable for deployment for takeaway or personal use. They require special equipment, administration by healthcare professionals, and cannot be broken down or repackaged for self-administration. These tests will continue to be used. Those tests, all of them, will continue to be used by medical health officers in appropriate settings to manage clusters and outbreaks. That leaves 577,440 tests that are more suitable for self-administered use, approximately one for every 10 British Columbians. And then there would be, uh, but of course, we are, there are requirements for healthcare, long-term care, remote communities and First Nations and other high-risk settings. And of course, as has been described by Dr. Henry today, as we move forward through K-12 and post-secondary in the coming weeks. These 577,000 tests will be used for symptomatic health care workers in acute care and for COVID testing sites, as well for businesses and organizations through point-of-care screening or program. The remainder are in the process of being repackaged with nasal swabs to replenish supply at testing sites and acute care, long-term care, and rural remote and Indigenous communities. As you'll note yesterday, Canada signaled its intention to deliver 140 million rapid tests that have been sourced for provinces and territories. BC's share of those tests, 13.5 percent or over 18 million, are expected to be received through January and February. However, the only tests that have been committed to BC with certainty are approximately 600,000 tests that are expected to arrive in BC over the next week. 90,000 of these tests will arrive in Vancouver today. 310,000 are on their way and expected to arrive early next week, and a further 200,000 are expected to arrive by late next week. 120,000 of these tests will be deployed as they arrive directly to health authorities for use by symptomatic health care workers in acute care. 280,000 will require processing and repackaging as they arrive and will be rapidly deployed on a daily basis to testing sites across BC. The 200,000 arriving late next week will be used by symptomatic teachers and school staff. Dr. Henry and Minister Whiteside spoke to reinforce safety measures in place for schools. I can add that the Ministries of Health and Education will work with the BCCDC and school districts over the next weeks to determine the best approach to distribute these new tests arriving late next week and to establish clear protocols for self-testing. As our supply increases in mid to late January, we will expand the availability of rapid tests uh, across education systems. We will continue to update the public on the deployment and use of rapid tests as we gain certainty on timing and supply from the federal government. It is important to remember that the announcement by the federal government that tens of millions of rapid tests have been secured does not mean they have been arrived, been delivered, or are ready for use in BC. And it's important to recognize that. We are very obviously pleased that the federal government has made this effort, but they are not here yet. And now, um, here's our weekly surgical renewal update. 
Health Authority's report from December 5th to December 11th that 7,049 surgeries were completed in BC, which is a remarkable achievement by surgeons, by nurses, by health sciences professionals, by healthcare workers in BC. While urgent and non-urgent scheduled surgeries are continuing around the province over the holiday period, health authorities postponed in that period, December 26th to January 1st, 38 non-urgent scheduled surgeries. That's two in Fraser Health, five in Vancouver Coastal Health, four in Northern Health, 27 in Interior Health. Cumulatively, from September 5th to January 1st, there have been 4,029 surgical postponements due to regional surges of COVID and factors including severe weather patterns. Patients are anticipating their surgery and are anxious about it and are ready to make that next step. Everyone involved in delivering surgeries, and by now I think all of us really, understands that no patient ever wants to receive a call postponing their surgery. Almost two years ago when our first postponement started, we made a commitment. Right then we said, you are not forgotten. Right then we said, we will, you, we will get you your surgery. And that is exactly what we did. And that's exactly what we'll continue to do. Several times now, the persistence of a virus that spreads to live has perhaps tempted us to dwell on what we can't do. Yet each time we've responded by focusing on all that we can do together, using the power and the ability we have to loosen COVID's hold. I want to express my appreciation to healthcare workers in testing, in vaccination, in acute care, in the community who are doing exceptional work. And I want to express my appreciation to everyone in BC who is, I believe, doing their part to help all of us, help each other, help our friends, our neighbours, to care for one another in the COVID-19 pandemic, to use the, the, the tools and the power that we have to address a very challenging time in the world. Over the last uh, seven days, test positivity in BC has run about 24 per cent in COVID-19. It's been relatively stable on a day-to-day -day average, but it's been stable at a very, very high level through more than 100,000 PCR tests, so an exceptional sample of where we are in British Columbia with respect to the pandemic. That is very high test positivity rates. You recall at the beginning of December, those test positivity rates, positivity rates were about 3%, so eight times higher than that. In, in this period, it's going to require more of us unfortunately, because I know all of you and all of us are tired, but we can do this together and we must do this together to do all of the things that you need to do to reduce the transmission in COVID-19 because all of the things you can do help our health care workers, our hospitals, our schools, everyone. I want to thank you for all you've done so far and I would, I, we're, we are uh, happy to take your questions. A reminder to media on the line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You'll be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question today comes from Zhao Zhu, Globe and Mail. Uh, Hi, Dr. Harry. Uh, infection disease expert at Stanford and uh, uh, expert at uh, told us that uh, your guidance earlier this week that uh, N95 masks offer only incremental protection to people in settings like stores or schools is wrong. They said with Omicron, uh, resp uh, respirators uh, are needed in crowded indoor uh, public settings. And a 2010 uh, peer review study showed more than three quarters of people put in known uh, the, uh, respirator for the first time did so properly and provided themselves better protection uh, than what surgical masks do achieve. What do you say to these experts criticizing your stance? And are you uh, reconsidering uh, offering students, teachers, or health workers free N95s? If not, why not? And Minister uh, Whiteside, the BCTF wants free N95s for anyone who wants them. Why won't your uh, ministry offer this? Thanks. Uh, so I think we need to put things into perspective and uh, uh, look at WHO documents, look at um, what we know about how things are transmitted in public settings, so outside of healthcare settings. And schools are a very good example. We have many, many things in place that make it very unlikely that uh, viruses and other pathogens will be transmitted in schools with the things that we have in place now. One of the most important things, and I would put this back to those experts, is about 
having layers of protection and a hierarchy of protection, which means you have things like reduced numbers of people, you have things like um, reducing the mixing and mingling of people. You have the same people going back to a class every day. So you're not uh, mixing with numbers of different people at different times. You have other things that are important to try and prevent um, the entrance of a hazard into that setting, like the daily screenings we do. So you can't become infected if there's nobody with the virus in the setting. So there are many things that we do in these structured settings to make sure that you don't have to rely on the moderately increased filtration um, capacity of a respirator versus a medical mask. And I think we need to be pragmatic and practical as well. We know that we're not seeing explosive outbreaks of this virus in those settings where we have these things in place. That is a fact. And we know that the best mask that you wear is a good quality one that is well fitting to your face. And I would just reiterate, that's the important thing. It's not, the mask is, is one piece of many prongs that we have in many different settings um, that protect people from transmission of viruses. So it's everything that we do that makes a difference so that you don't have to rely on um, the increased filtration of, of a respirator versus a, a surgical mask. And in um, school settings, in the public settings, outside of healthcare settings, it's much more important that you have a good quality, good fitting mask that you wear and that you wear consistently and that you wear correctly. We'll now go to Vancouver for the rest of the response. Thank you, and really, thank you, and really, just to add to um, to Dr. Henry's comments, to say that uh, in uh, the education sector, we work very closely and uh, under the advice and direction of um, our public health advisors at the CDC. And the advice that we've received in the sector is to ensure that we can provide the uh, the three the the the, the three layer uh, disposable masks throughout our system, and to importantly uh, ensure that we're reinforcing that message and that uh, that. We're working with students uh, to ensure that there's appropriate uh, use of masks and that they're available. And we've been working with our suppliers to ensure that, there is a, that there's a good supply of masks uh, available next week when kids come back to school. Thank you. Yes, I do. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned you will no longer report school outbreaks and instead will monitor attendance. And if it dips below, then the school will contact public health. How will uh, parents know if their child has been exposed to a sick child and how will parents know if there has been an outbreak at their school? At what point will a school revert to online learning and uh, is that the only way parents will know if there has been an outbreak? Thanks. Um, I think so maybe just to start and turn it back to, and turn it back to uh, Dr. Henry just w with respect to the reporting of exposures and, and, and such. Uh, what, what we understand uh, uh, in the current situation that we're in with Omicron is that in under, uh, having access to information about individual test positive cases is, is not going to be possible. So we need a proxy to understand what's happening in schools. So schools know very well what their attendance rates are and how they fluctuate fluctuate and what, what, they, what is typical for this time of year. So schools will be monitoring on a daily basis as they always do uh, for that, uh, for attendance as a trigger. And when it reaches a certain point, that will be a trigger to say that there's something going on in a classroom or across a grade or in a school and that requires an intervention by, by public health. When a school notifies um, public health that there is a sort of a, what we might call a signal of concern with respect to attendance, the, a notification will also go out to the school community. The school community will know when a school has notified uh, public health that there's a, that there's a matter for, uh, for concern. And, and with respect to, uh, to a shift to home-based learning, that is a decision, a, a call that, uh, that, that schools will make based on their assessment of what is, uh, what is happening with their, with their own 
own workforce in terms of um, are there do they do they have enough uh, enough uh, staff to be able to operate the school uh, to operate classes uh, uh, safely and so those uh, again are situations where likely the decision will be made quickly but parents would be notified that that was to that that, that will happen there will be a, a short time for transition and then home-based learning will will commence and those are the very plans that schools have been developing and and are ready to to put in place that's been part of the work of this this week and perhaps I can turn it back to dr. Henry for the question about about exposure notification. no thank you I think that summarized it really well and just to, to be very clear we are always going to um, notify parents of outbreaks that has not changed and that's what we do for other respiratory infections measles in classrooms or in, in school settings other uh, um, outbreaks that happen as well so it is not uh, going to change that and how we'll understand if there are outbreaks is by monitoring things like uh, attendance and um, people uh, both staff and students who are off ill so that continues and remains in place what we are no longer able to do and it makes uh, is not um, uh, right now is those individual case exposures that were being notified um, over the past couple of, um, of months and years so it because of the way this is transmitting so rapidly and we are no longer doing individual case and contact tracing in the community because of the change in the parameters that we're seeing with Omicron it's not effective to do that because of the short incubation period and the rapid transmission so we cannot rely on individual case and contact tracing so that is why we're not we're no longer be able to do uh, individual uh, case exposure notifications in schools so that will change and it will change to be um, trying to understand if there's a risk of an outbreak and being able to take action um, if we see absenteeism increase so those are the, the changes that are necessitated by the way that this new strain of the virus is transmitting. Thank you very much. And a reminder to media on the line, please do limit yourselves to one question and one follow-up. That will allow us to get to as many of your colleagues as possible. Our next question goes to Sinjin Alexander, CTV. We are. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this question, I guess, is for Dr. Henry and Mr. Dix. I'm hoping you can help me understand the, the definition of outbreak, especially in care homes and acute care. What do you consider an outbreak? Is, we're also hearing that it's really just for an uncontrolled spread. Is that true? It's only for an uncontrolled spread? That's what you consider an outbreak? Or, or what do you consider an outbreak? So we have had a, an outbreak in long-term care and acute care has been defined for COVID for some time and it is uh, um, it, it, more than one uh, staff person depending on the situation or a single resident or patient who's uh, tested positive for COVID-19. So that's um, what triggers a, a single staff person triggers uh, an enhanced uh, monitoring and testing and if more people turn up positive then that is declared an outbreak but a single resident case or patient case means that somehow there's been transmission within that setting so that's where an outbreak is declared do you have a follow-up Sinjin I do uh, thank you I'm also looking at uh, I know you were talking a lot about um, the hospitals and a shortage of staff there and uh, I know there's some doctors and nurses who are COVID positive and there was a lot of talk about whether they should be allowed back in the hospital to help um, treat patients and, and do their work. Where are you in that? Will you allow doctors and nurses who are COVID positive to work again? So I've said this uh, quite a few times but I'll say it again. We have um, health human resource planning in place um, right now uh, that has been since the very beginning we have principles that we use um, things like calling people back from vacation and time off extending hours um, having people work in different areas so there's a whole series of things that we do to try and manage um, when pe when people are off ill as COVID is spreading through the community so these things have been in play and are continuing to be put in place 
one of the last resort if we get to that point where uh, we are uh, it will compromise uh, care for people then we might be uh, find so we have a fitness for work protocol it's called for healthcare workers who are infected with omicron who have very mild symptoms or, or asymptomatic and they can come back under certain conditions if needed. So as, as I've said a number of times, this is a last resort. We of course do not want to have people who are ill working for a whole variety of reasons, for their own health and as well uh, the risk that it brings to the setting. So there are protocols in place for when it might be needed and where people would work. For example, we would not have somebody who has uh, had mild case of COVID working on a cancer ward. They would work probably uh, with COVID patients, for example. So those are things that we have protocols in place that have been um, dusted off again to make sure that if we get to that point, uh, we have a process that allows, uh, if necessary, um, people to work if they have mild illness and they're able to work. Now over to Minister Dix in Vancouver. Vancouver. Just to say that this is why we made the decision a number of weeks ago now that as of January 4th we were going to delay uh, non-urgent scheduled surgeries in our province. And we're obviously assessing that on a week-to-week -week basis but uh, that's one of the ways we have and it comes at a price um, but it's one of the ways that we have to reduce the number of people in the hospital and allow us to use our staff more effectively to deal with the circumstances of the Omicron variant of concern. In long-term care and in, and in acute care, there is significant planning that's taken place at every stage of the pandemic. You'll note in August of 2020, we announced a plan and a detailed plan of our health human resources strategies uh, for that fall and winter. Uh, and Fortunately, in that fall and winter, we saw fewer, for example, influenza cases than we typically see. The challenge in January is that there is typically more people in our hospitals in, in January, such that in this date, um, before the COVID pandemic in 2019, there were well over 100% of base beds full at that time. There are more other kinds of illness, more people dealing with things such as influenza, but other uh, respiratory illness, uh, particularly vulnerable people, and other conditions that people are facing. So that's why we're taking, we've taken action in the areas that we have control to give ourselves the best chance to deal with this. So what you're talking about, Sinjin, is something that uh, might be envisioned at some point in the future in order to address something. But right now, the current rules and the continuing rules apply. We want people who are sick to stay home. Question. We go to uh, Richard Zussman, Global News. Part of the anxiousness people are feeling is around sort of a lack of specifics. So on this trigger that you mentioned, in terms of dropping below attendance, what creates the trigger? And the other thing I've heard from a lot of people in the system is at what point does a school close for functional reasons? Is it 20% of staff not available? 30% of staff not available, what point does a functional closure get triggered? And for families, they are concerned about when they even send their kids back. So when is it safe if you have COVID symptoms but can't access a test, when can you send your child back to school? If you're 5 to 11, does it even matter if they've received a vaccine or not? So perhaps I'll start and then uh, uh, Minister Whiteside can, uh, can respond as well. Yeah, you know, this has been a really challenging thing for parents all along is, you know, is it, is it COVID? Should I keep them home? Is it that runny nose that's been going on for a long time? So those decisions right now are, are will continue to be those challenging ones. I would say, if in doubt, um, keep your child home right now. And yes, it does make a huge difference if you're vaccinated, especially the 5 to 11. And I encourage all young people to get vaccinated. We know and we're seeing 
increasing evidence. You know, Omicron does affect younger people and it is more upper airway and there's some concern that it can exacerbate asthma more likely than some of the other variants that we've seen so far. So that there is good protection even after dose one. It it helps. Um, so that is important to get children protected from getting sick from this. And yes, it's going to be a challenging thing as we, you know, get more and more, um, hopefully, of the at-home tests available, we'll be able to support families in being able to do that. And that's something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, but we have not yet had those types of tests available in Canada or in BC. So that is coming, but it's not going to get us through this next few weeks. We need to continue to use your good judgment and, you know, parents know kids, um, and if in doubt, keep them home for a day. If, they, if it's getting better and resolving, then you can go back into school. So that's how we're going to have to manage this through this next Next little while. Um, the, in terms of the, the cutoffs and when uh, the absenteeism, we're looking at 10% above normal. And this, these are things that will vary a little bit depending on the school and the district and um, how they're able to bring other people in to support. So there's no one cutoff in terms of uh, what would lead to a functional closure. And I, I think Minister Whiteside can address that in more detail. But each, uh, each principal, each school, each school staff, they understand the, the regular pattern of absenteeism in their in our, our kids who are off sick, um, staff absenteeism in their schools and, and the patterns that they see. So we've been working, we in public health have been working with them to, to have the protocols that are in place to support administrators and to connect when they have a concern so that we can help in the investigation of determining exactly what's happening in that school. And Minister, did you want to add to that? to that? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Henry, and, and thank you, Richard, for the question. Uh, and I just to reinforce, you know, ed educators know their classrooms, principals and vice principals know their schools, and superintendents know their districts. So they know what is a general level of, um, of absence on any day in the system, where a number of students and staff would be, uh, would not be at school for a number of, of different kinds of reasons. So they know what that, what that level is, and if it's 90%, and their, and their attendance drops you know, down towards 80%, then that, that will be a trigger. Um, but they will also be monitoring on a daily basis to understand and to see what, what is, what, what's happening uh, in, in their school. Um, and if that trigger is, uh, you know, if absenteeism is, uh, if attendance or it rather is, is higher or slightly lower, that is the, um, that, that is what the, what a school will use to assess, to help assess what's, uh, what, what, where, whether there is a, what we're, what we're calling a signal of, of concern that, that needs attention from, from public health. With respect to functional closures, you know, it will look different from district to district. We have, a, we have you know, almost 1,600 public schools um, in the system, over 300 independent schools. We have a lot of different sizes and varieties and shapes of schools. And so it's different uh, in a school of, uh, of 300 students versus a school of uh, 18 or 1,900 students. In, in Surrey, the superintendent has said that generally when they're looking at a staff abs uh, uh, um, uh, absentee rate of around 25% if they have 25% or so of their of their staff out with uh, with illness then that's going to be a challenge for them to to um, to operate some of their schools so all districts are superintendents they're looking at that question but it will be diff a bit different from district to district and uh, schools are going to be uh, working very hard to communicate with parents in their school communities as we move through uh, the, the the coming weeks Richard, do you have a follow-up? Dr. Henry, with the announcement today around the COVID safety plans, how quickly do they come into place? And did this have anything to do with the announcement we found out today that the Canucks uh, would be postponing uh, their game tomorrow? Like, was there any conversation with the team that uh, there was going to be a reduction in capacity or, redu or change in rules that made it impossible for the team uh, to operate? And, and for Minister Dix, uh, with the concerns yesterday uh, at the convention center, people waiting uh, more than two hours uh, to get their uh, vaccine, have changes been made there? And are you worried about the fact that hundreds of thousands of people will be hitting six months in the next few weeks and we just don't have the capacity there yet to manage this influx that's coming? 
So I guess I'll start. Um, in terms of the COVID safety plans, um, I've been engaged with many different uh, sectors and industry sectors, as have some of our team over the last few weeks. And many of the, the sectors, I think of uh, the, the food pro um, processing plants, for example, um, they really embraced uh, the, uh, the, the measures that were put in place and continue to have them in place. I know in some places and some retail places, they've taken away some of the barriers and they've changed things. So it is a move to go back to those. It will be an order, as I've said and uh, we'll be transitioning to, to getting those back. It's a consultative process as well, and that's part of the uh, how they have worked so well. It's between the employer and the employees, and it'll be publicly posted. And so I will say uh, to people who are used to um, not having to do things um, in the last little while, that we're in a new phase again, and we need to go back to being mindful of uh, numbers of people that were, are in a setting, wearing masks, making sure that we are wearing wearing our mask and if we can't, um, finding alternate ways to get the things that we need, whether that's curbside or uh, ordering online, um, because this is an important time to protect workers in those settings and to make sure that we have those things in place that help preserve the, the healthcare work or the, the, the workers in those settings and, and keep them from being um, exposed additionally within their workplace setting. So they will come into place um, in the next, uh, I expect there'll be a bit of a transition for some uh, businesses and some of them will already have things in place already. Uh, we're working with WorkSafe BC and the, the information is uh, is out there so over the coming week I expect these to be up and, and uh, in place across industries across the province. Um, in terms of the Canucks, we've had an ongoing discussions, I've said this before, um, supporting uh, their safe operations and uh, it was a decision, I provided advice, but it was a decision that they made uh, to uh, postpone both the last game and this game, um, given the situation that we're faced with here and the situation they're faced with in the NHL as well. Now over to Vancouver. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, I would say that we've seen uh, uh, a significant increase in capacity to meet all of those people who are at the six-month point or or, uh, or longer in the last couple of three days. 142,000 uh, vaccines administered in three days, 101,000 over the last two days, including yesterday at the convention center, 5,000. Now, at the convention center, there's two sets of things to remember. We ramped that up from zero to 5,000 very quickly. And that was, uh, I think, uh, reflects the extraordinary work done by our BC immunization teams. A significant number of people at the convention center yesterday, and it caused a bit of a challenge for us and for people. Uh, but one in four of the people that we surveyed did not have an appointment. You can only get a third dose. Um, uh, vaccination if you get an, if you have an appointment and that makes the system work better for everybody and we've got to communicate that and that's what I'm doing today so there are some places where you can get a drop in for a first and second dose there are no drop-ins for third doses the good news is that there are hundreds of th hundreds of thousands of open appointments such that yesterday a, a constituent of mine got an appointment uh, for Saturday on Tuesday uh, at, or I guess yesterday was well, yes, it was Wednesday, I think. I forget what day of the week we are now, but uh, Friday. Right? But uh, yesterday, in any event, got one for Saturday. So we have lots of appointments that are coming available and going to be coming available. So we are raising the capacity of the system to meet this challenge, and I am confident we're going to be able to do it. Our teams did an ex have done an exceptional job over the last couple of days. I apologize to people who waited uh, in line for a couple of hours at the convention center, but I also thank them for their perseverance, for getting through, and for getting their booster dose. It's important when you're invited to get your booster dose to get it. And finally, I just want to say, in addition to all of that, we are doing, obviously, an immunization program for children 511, with the 5 to 11, with the specialized, designed for them, pediatric vaccine uh, against COVID-19. And uh, to date, 140,711 children 5 to 11 have received their vaccination. 166,000 have received or and have booked an appointment. And a total of 182,000 have registered. 
Now that leaves approximately 167,000 children who have not yet been registered in the system. I encourage them to do so. We have about 90 centers around BC that are that have the pediatric uh, vaccine, the Pfizer pediatric vaccine for children 5 to 11 designed for them. And I encourage every single one of those parents to register their children today. For the next question, we go to Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Henry, I'd like to know what changed uh, from last week when you didn't want to um, start or begin any orders on businesses. And without an accurate data count on case count numbers, how will you be able to tell if your orders are working? Yeah, so a, a couple of things. I think there was some, um, uh, when I said I wanted to get out of the order business, that was about getting through this pandemic, that we don't want to have orders that require us to do certain things. Um, and they are a function of, of how we've had to manage to get through this pandemic. And I stand by that. And we want to do this few orders as possible. And yes, we, you know, orders closing businesses down are things that I don't want to do and I absolutely don't want to do. Um, but we do t take take them very seriously and they they are orders what i talked about last week or earlier this week was the least restrictive means the things that we can do that will um, the the minimum amount of disruption to accomplish what we need to do which is to minimize sickness and and death to min to protect our health care system and to minimize the disruption that we're causing on society especially the negative disruption so uh, this is uh, uh, one of the things that we has worked for us in the past and in consultation with industry it makes it much cleaner if we have an order and that uh, it lays out all of the the requirements under the order so that's why we're doing it I didn't mean to imply in any way that I wouldn't do orders if they were necessary it's mostly um, we want to get through this part so that we can come back to learning how to live with this as another respiratory virus in our lives and we're not there yet but I do think we will get there, and we'll, we'll get there as, as, you know, as we get through this, this wave and hopefully into the spring. I think it's going to be a very different situation for us, and, and I won't need to, to put in orders anymore. Um, and I'm sorry, I lost the second piece of what you said, uh, uh, Lisa. Sorry. How, how, how difficult is it to judge whether the orders are working if you know, uh, yeah, the yeah. data you're able to collect on case count? Yeah, so case counts have only been one thing that we've, and and to be honest, uh, we've been trying to move away from the daily case counts as an indicator of what's happening, um, because they only reflect uh, case rates um, and testing rates in different areas. So it's one of the surveillance markers that we use, and it's very consistent. So we've been using the PCR uh, daily case counts, but really, uh, as we introduced uh, uh, over a year ago, the, the seven-day rolling average gives us a better sense because that uh, takes into account um, daily variations that we see in different testing centers and testing sites. So it is one indicator, but it's not the only one by any means. Things like we talk about quite a bit, the percent positivity. So that is a, a marker that tells us over time. Um, in a number of our modeling sessions, I present a number of other things that we look at, whether it's hospitalizations, ICU, the percent of, of, of testing, the rate of testing, sorry, in different age groups and different communities, that helps us under, put the testing and the daily counts in perspective. We are also, uh, we have an online reporting for rapid antigen test positivity, and that's expanding. It's going to be available by early next week for everybody in the province, and we are getting some information from that. It is limited because we don't have a denominator. We don't know how many people actually are using it, but it does give us a sense of what proportion of, of tests uh, that uh, are reported are positive out of the ones that we've distributed. So it's an imperfect marker. Uh, I talked a lot about uh, in our last modeling about the wastewater surveillance that we're doing in a number of different areas. So there's many different streams of surveillance that help us give it, get an understanding of, a, of what actually is happening with the pandemic and the trajectory of the pandemic in, the, in BC. Now over to Minister Dix in Vancouver. In Vancouver. I just uh, want to note uh, on this point that uh, 
Dr. Henry, our teams in public health brought in new orders December 20th, December 23rd, December 29th, and December 31st. So there's no reluctance to use their web, use orders where they're designed to help people and to re reduce the transmission of COVID-19, and Dr. Henry has demonstrated that. What I know from, from my observations and our engagement with public health is that every time that step is taken, every time, Dr. Henry considers the consequences of that, the consequences of the order, mental health and otherwise, and business consequences, all the consequences before taking the order. Every one of those orders is taken with reluctance. It is taken with reluctance, the limitation of visitation to long-term care, because we understand, I understand, Dr. Henry understands the consequences of that. But the action was taken because it was necessary to take that action. And I think the process and the work of Dr. Henry and her team in this area is just exemplary. I'm very proud of them, and I'm very proud of their approach, which is to use all of the layers of protection, to use orders when necessary, and understand that all of those orders have consequences other than on COVID-19. and wastewater monitoring um, in your response. Uh, will you share publicly the data that you're collecting on rapid tests uh, where people register through the website? And, and can you explain why the data on wastewater testing has not been updated on the website since December the 20th? Uh, I think it's the 20th that it wasn't updated. Yeah, um, absolutely. We're, we're collating that and um, trying to understand what it means. And uh, I fully intend to uh, to make it public once we have an, an understanding of how to best present that and what how to interpret it. These are not easy things to interpret. As I mentioned, I'm talking about sorry the the online reporting of rapid antigen test positivity. And so uh, it, it, there's complications when you don't have a denominator. And if we look at the UK, for example. Um, this is a model for how they've uh, been using at-home tests for a long time and they have a QR code and you can download but they don't have a sense of how many people are actually using the tests and how many people are actually reporting online so it's tricky to, to know what it actually tells you so we're working um, to, to come up with a framework to understand what it means and yes I'll be absolutely be presenting that and the reason um, that there was a pause in some of the reporting of the wastewater surveillance is because uh, um, particularly at the, the wastewater sites it takes time and people to do the, the type of testing and they uh, those people needed a break over the holidays so they spent time with their families and we suspended uh, some of the data uh, collection for a short period of time but uh, that's been um, now that they've been able to have a little bit of time um, as we know a lot of people have been working very long hours and including our laboratory staff so those uh, that surveillance will be continuing next question Christopher folds Kamloops this week hi uh, thanks for this uh, opportunity um, I, I just spoke with a employee of a long-term care home here in Kamloops and um, they say, and I, I want to clarify if this is the right policy, they say they, they, they give uh, rapid tests to essential visitors, but the visitor then just goes in and visits while they, the, the employee waits for the results of the test that takes about 15 minutes. They said there is three today in which the, uh, the essential visitor does the rapid test and goes in to visit. And I said that doesn't make any sense. And the employee says even if it's positive, they're allowed to go in because the rapid test aren't as reliable in the Omicron detection. Is this the, the policy or is she wrong? Uh, that's not a, the policy that we would have in place. No, I think that's a, a loose interpretation of the policy. And so I would encourage them to review their protocols that they have in place. And uh, I know that uh, we've been working with the care homes on how to, how to put those protocols in place across the province in the last little while. Chris, do you have a follow-up? Oh, yeah. The thing yeah. you, you Sorry, talked Chris. about, you know, whether uh, the rapid tests are, are as good for Omicron, and there's limitations to the rapid tests. And heaven knows, I've said that a few times before. Um, but if they are positive, it is a, a good indication that you should not be visiting that day. Um, and 
uh, depending on the, the person, they may need to, to have another test. But um, it, it, there is some um, concerns out there that uh, Delta is better detected by an NP or a nasal swab and Omicron might be better detected by a throat swab. It's mostly theoretical right now um, and the nasal swabs that we have and the rapid tests that we have seem to be working just as well from what we can tell for Omicron as for Delta and the other strains that we're seeing. So not perfect by any means um, but still the nasal swab is the way that we would recommend doing it right now. There is some in the lab circle uh, discussions about whether you do a throat and a nasal uh, at the, with the same swab, but um, for now, uh, the data that we have supports that using them with the nasal swab right now is, is as good as we can do right now. Chris, do you have a follow-up? Unrelated follow-up, that's to, uh, with hospital hospitalizations of COVID patients, can you clarify how they are counted as COVID patients? If a person goes to the hospital for non-COVID related matter, let's say a car accident, they have broken bones, but in the course of being admitted, they test positive for COVID, even though they're asymptomatic, are they then counted as a COVID patient or are COVID patients only counted when they go there and they're really sick and they have to go in the hospital? Yeah, so this is something that um, is, I've talked about a few times before as well. There's several different ways that we look at uh, hospitalization with COVID and, um, and we are working through it as are our colleagues across the country and we had a discussion on our Chief Medical Officer of Health call about this very thing. Um, especially now where we're trying to understand the severity of illness with Omicron. So we're trying to tease apart people who are in hospital from COVID, people who are in hospital with COVID, and people who are in hospital because COVID uh, uh, exacerbated one of their underlying conditions. And it's not easy to do that, uh, except by going and looking at every individual chart. So we have several ways that we are measuring right now hospitalization, and we're in the process of, of looking at how we can make this more, um, more automated, more streamlined, uh, less people intensive, and give us a sense of what we need to know. So we are we are right now measuring two different things. One of them is everybody in a hospital, in a facility with a COVID positive test. So that will be a mixture of people who came in for something else and were screened um, for surgery, for example, for you know, somebody who had trauma who was going for surgery, might have had a, a, a COVID screen and had a positive test. People who, um, we have a couple of outbreaks right now in acute care and uh, people who were involved in the outbreak, so they were in hospital for something else um, and they tested positive as part of the outbreak. People who are actually truly in hospital because COVID made them sick enough to require hospital care. So it is an overestimation of the burden that uh, Omicron is, is causing, um, but it is a number that we get. It, it's not 100% um, accurate every single day because it relies on people counting who's in every single hospital and then collating that information. So that's one of the uh, measures that we get. Another one that we that takes even more information <laughs> is uh, looking at everybody who's tested positive for COVID-19 and that's based on our laboratory PCR testing and epidemiologic link testing and then looking at how, how many of them in the course of their in illness require hospitalization. So that is a measure of how severe is the illness on average and that's an important measure we want to know for Omicron compared to Delta, for example. But that recall, requires linkage of information from the laboratory, um, from the, on the individual with hospitalization uh, lists. And so it takes more time to do that and it takes a little bit of a delay. So what we're working on and what we've been um, presenting is a bit of a composite of both of those uh, pieces of information which are collected for two different reasons and we're in the process right now of trying to tease through what's the best measure for us to understand the impact of Omicron on, uh, on severity of illness and on hospitalizations. So we'll have more to say about that uh, in the coming week. And uh, I know I've been sharing this, this, these discussions with my colleagues in Ontario and Alberta because we're all trying to struggle with uh, some of those measures. We have time for one more question. We'll go to Bell Peary, CBC. 
Thank you. And uh, in English and French, please. Dr. Henry, uh, you and Richard talked about, you know, students getting sick. But I want to ask you, um, it's probably safe to say that uh, right now, many students have family members who have COVID at home, but the students don't have any symptoms, the children don't have any symptoms. Um, can those children, students go to school? Like, What's your guidance for families dealing with COVID in their households right now? Yeah, so I, I think uh, the, the short answer is yes. Um, we are, um, particularly children with mild illness and less likely to, to uh, have symptoms. Um, it, it, yes, we are still allowing uh, children to go to school uh, in those settings and to be to monitor very carefully. If there's a, a really sick people in the house and the, you know, the, it may be up to uh, families to make those decisions about uh, whether they want to keep children home um, in those scenarios. Now we'll go to Vancouver for Minister Dix. Ce que la, la Dr. Henry vient de dire, c'est que des gens qui ont des, euh, des euh, symptômes ou qui n'ont qui n'ont pas de symptômes mais euh, qui ont des cas dans leur famille, euh, sont, euh, il est possible pour, pour eux d'aller à l'école. Or, Uh, si les symptômes sont sérieux dans la maison ou si l'enfant a des symptômes, uh, c'est évident que l'enfant ne doit pas aller à l'école. Donc il y a une certaine uh, flexibilité, des choix pour les familles, mais c'est important pour des enfants d'aller à l'école. Mais uh, il faut prendre au sérieux ce qui se passe avec le, le COVID-19 et prendre la bonne décision. Donc le, les conseils, conseils de, que Dr. Henry viennent de dire, euh, viennent d'offrir, sont importants. Mais il faut que tout le monde soit prudent dans ce, en ce moment parce que nous avons un taux de transmission dans la province de à peu près 24 dans notre système de tests dans la province. Et c'est important de rester prudent en toutes circonstances. Thought about this, but of course, the important things are, are making sure that they're wearing a mask when they're in school, that they uh, um, uh, are doing all of the other things that uh, help prevent transmission of infections. Do you have a follow up, Bell? Yes, please. And again, in English and French, Dr. Henry, the BC CDC has new testing advice on its website, and it suggests that people with a couple of symptoms for more than 24 hours should get tested. Now that seems to contradict what you just said about not needing a test if you only have mild symptoms. Um, so the, the guidance on the BC CDC website talks about the types of symptoms, but we also um, put that in the context of whether you're uh, vaccinated or not vaccinated and your risk. So uh, we are in the process of updating that, but I thought it had been changed. Um, but really, it, it, right now, with the type of illness we're seeing and with the rapid transmission and the finite capacity that we have to do, particularly PCR testing, um, that if you don't have severe illness, you're not immunocompromised and you're vaccinated and you have uh, mild illness, you don't need a test right now.